so I'm Sue Hutchison. I'm president of Equifax Canada, Canada's largest credit bureau. And I want to welcome uh, all of you and in, really to introduce the topic, just to say a few things before we get going. 2021 was really a watershed year in cybersecurity. We witnessed a record number of data breaches, a wave of ransomware attacks, penetration of our digital supply chains and disruption of critical infrastructure. To top it off, we concluded the year with the landmark Log4j vulnerability and the looming threat of a conflict in Russia and the Ukraine. And in that macro backdrop of society's increasing technical dependence, it's indisputable that an unprecedented levels of cyber risk are upon us. So to today, I'm really delighted to have with me a very impressive panel to discuss this important topic. So let's get started. Um, you know, maybe what we'll do is uh, for my panelists, uh, if we could set the scene and also if you would introduce yourselves, your role and organization, and just tell us how would you characterize what's happening in our ecosystem with respect to cybercrime and what is driving the rise during what's being called the digital pandemic. And I thought, uh, Sammy, I'm gonna kick it off uh, with you. Thanks, Sue. Uh, so my name is Tammy Curry. I'm the head of the Canadian Center for Cybersecurity, and that's that's uh, within the communication security establishment. It's the one place the federal government brought together cybersecurity expertise uh, to tackle not just the government defending the government, but also help critical infrastructure, small aware of cyber threats and raise the bar on cybersecurity and build resilience into our ecosystem. Um, definitely, as Sue pointed out, cybersecurity is a major concern. It can happen to anybody. Um, cyber incidents, uh, you know, none of us are immune to cyber incidents, but it takes a team to tackle it. And uh, it's all about partnerships. As you can see on this panel, we come from different uh, sectors of Canadian society, and we all work together uh, to work uh, to sort of raise the bar on cybersecurity. Wonderful. Thanks, Sammy. Over, you, over to you, Greg. Yeah, thanks, Sue. Uh, Greg Markell, the president and CEO of Ridge Canada Cyber Solutions. We are an insurance company. We're what's insurance speak, in insurance speak, excuse me, a managing general agent, which means that uh, we actually do product design, underwriting in house on behalf of other uh, insurance companies and reinsurers uh, from across the world. We I have a focus on uh, security from Lloyd's of London, and uh, yeah, we've been around since 2016. Wonderful. Over to you, Carrie. Carrie oh, Fry. <clears throat> Am I coming through now, Sue? You're good. Thank you, and my apologies. My name is Carrie Fry. I'm the Chief Security Officer of TELUS where I'm responsible for the protection of all of our company's uh, assets, infrastructure, and people, including cybersecurity. And as well, we provide managed security services to several hundred businesses and public sector organizations in Canada, from the smallest businesses to the largest enterprises and largest uh, public sector departments in our country. And I would just uh, top up to what Sammy uh, said, saying that, um, uh, obviously, and, and, and Sue, uh, we're in a wartime footing effectively with um, a, a major combat going on in Europe where um, cyber is part of the dimension in that warfare, coupled with one of, one of the largest waves of crime globally ever, which is a manifestation of our vulnerability and the fusion of uh, highly sophisticated cyber weapons with an innovative approach to scaling uh, ransomware and digital crime uh, stealing from the best, uh, you know, sort of Silicon Valley innovations in how to run a business. And we'll talk more about that a little bit later in the panel. Wonderful. Thanks for the introduction. Over to you, Octavia. Hi, everyone. My name is Octavia Howell. I am the CISO of Equifax Canada. Uh, Equifax Canada is a data analytics company that actually correlates in, um, and helps customers and consumers to what we call live your best by being able to actually provide information and data, um, the most sensitive and classified data, right? 
so that you can actually be able to, you know, live a financial, uh, your financial best and live your financial life. Um, what we, what I see that's happening in this environment now is our adversaries, those who are, you know, threat actors, they're doing what we should be doing, right? And they're starting to come together. Um, as Carrie mentioned, this is kind of like a wartime um, where they have looked at the same thing that kind of moved us into uh, transformation or digital transformation. They're doing the same thing. We moved into digital transformation where everything had to go online. Everyone had to come together. And those threat actors did the exact same thing. Um, they just figured out how to do it a little bit better and quicker than we did. So we could talk a little bit about that as we kind of uh, go through the rest of the panel. However, that's where we stand. And I think it's our roles as we come together as a, a industry and a, as a community to be better and to work together. So, so Sammy, sticking with this um, worry and I think wartime footing, you said, Carrie, um, what, tell us a little bit about how the government's um, looking at the Canadian ecosystem in terms of what's what's going on out there at, at this point. How would you sort of characterize it? I think you're on mute, Sammy. Most popular saying in the last two years, right here. <laughs> um, the, the Cyber Center has issued so far a uh, national cyber threat assessment in 2018 and a national and an updated one in 2020, and we are most likely going to issue one in 2022, which is meant to, to characterize what is the threat landscape that we see and what do we need to do about it. There's many constant between 2018 and 2020 and 2022, and that's the rise of cyber crime and specifically uh, ransomware, but also the nation state uh, threat posed by Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran, uh, targeting intellectual property, as, as Kerry pointed out, uh, strategic threat to the government, espionage, and uh, also the critical infrastructure sector. So, uh, you know, the threat that we see is that we need to up our game across all the sectors, not just, uh, you know, critical infrastructure. We need to up our game on protecting our intellectual property. Canada is an innovator as a country, and we need to make sure that we protect that, that innovation. Uh, ransomware is, uh, you know, targeting indiscriminately many sectors of society, and, and we're paying a, a price for that. So how do we raise the bar on this? So we need to be prepared. We need to raise our cybersecurity, uh, our vigilance, uh, and also the Ukraine-Russia conflict has added a new dimension now that we are seeing uh, cyber criminal take sides. So whereas previously, the two threats were separate. Cyber criminal was one threat and nation state was another. Now they're, they're blending together and some cyber criminal organization have decided to take sides uh, one way or another. So we are, we are monitoring what's happening in the Ukraine. Uh, we are putting out threat bulletins. We just issued one last week branded with CISA and our uh, US partners and international partners to bring light to the uh, to the Russia threat uh, that was on the heels of another one we issued in January. So the threat is real and it's important to pay attention to some of these cyber bulletins and cyber threats that alerts that we are publishing. And you mentioned uh, uh, Sammy ransomware. Carrie, tell us, did a, a recent study on, on ransomware, what did it find? So, so we did, and it found that um, of all the businesses that we interviewed, 83% reported that they had um, at least had a ransomware attempt made on them, and 67% reported that they had experienced a ransomware incident. And the uh, verticals that were most targeted in that group were healthcare, agriculture, and finance. Um, so, you know, bottom line, what the survey tells us is that every business in Canada is vulnerable to ransomware and, uh, you know, uh, many of them uh, did not have uh, the adequate defenses or protections, if that is in fact possible, to ward off these attacks. And so um, you can read more about that study uh, on our website, but um, it goes on to talk about what are the types of defenses that are working and, uh, you know, I think the panel will, will certainly uh, talk about the fact that um, we know that there are solutions that exist and that we could be doing better. So bottom line, it's an issue for all businesses in Canada to be aware of and to and should and really should be going to ask 
uh, an expert in this area, am I, am I protected enough from this threat? And if not, what should I do? And Greg, from an insurance industry perspective, um, you had shared with me, you're seeing a big change in terms of these attacks, in terms of uh, claims. Maybe tell us a little bit about what you're seeing. Sure, <clears throat> and Canada is certainly not immune. Just to echo uh, Sammy and Carrie's and Carrie's points, is you know we've always had this this mentality of you know we're too small or we're too nice or anything like that. Uh, the reality is, is it, um, when it comes to ransomware and when it comes to business email compromise, it is very much indiscriminate. Um, we've seen a big uptake, uh, which started in in the claims world in Q2 of 2020. And it's no secret that the networks were challenged at that point in time with the migration of labor to work from home. And that exposed <clears throat> many vulnerabilities. And the insurance industry was, uh, you know, we're paying out on a lot of this stuff. But to give you a little bit of a flavor as to the size and scope and what we're seeing um, from cyber, from a cyber insurance perspective, um, direct, we measure things by gross written premiums. Um, so the industry itself grew from 2020 to 2021 from about 222 million uh, taken in to 327 million. But uh, the 222 million is, is the denominator, is the easiest way to think about that. Um, the losses that were paid out in 2020 in calendar year 2020 was 601 million. And that was net. Uh, of commission expenses and everything else of which insurance companies typically run at about 40%. So gross that up by 40% and you get about $4 out for every dollar taken in by the insurance industry in 2020. Uh, you know, a little bit of the growth obviously in the denominator through 2021 is helpful. However, um, when you look at overall at the industry itself, we're still running at about 111% net or 50 cents out for every dollar taken in. And a lot of that is uh, ransomware. It's it's very much ransomware driven. And I know we're going to get into, uh, you know, some of the preventative measures, as, as Gary alluded to, uh, that businesses can take. Um, but from an insurance perspective, when it comes to small, mid-sized business, we've been focusing exclusively on educating awareness um, and improving minimum hygiene requirements, as we deem them, uh, for small businesses out there in Canada. That's great. And, and uh, Sammy and Octavia, do, do we have a sense on like, how are some of the small and medium sized businesses doing? You know, what, what makes this challenging for them? I would imagine, you know, not, not dedicated cyber teams, perhaps not as much investment uh, and expertise, but what are, what are your thoughts on that? So I can... go ahead, Octavia. I could take it and then maybe Sammy, I think that, you know, what we have to do, especially as larger organizations, um, those who can help, we, we believe, especially at Equifax, that security is not a trade secret, right? We have to be able to and be willing to actually do like we're doing now, have these conversations, be willing to invest, be willing to work with, you know, organizations like the Cybersecurity Center, right? Be able to actually help our colleagues be, um, to be able to to fortify and to help um, and to give solutions to them, right? Um, so I think what we need to do is kind of band together more as an industry. Previously, um, you know, in, you know, financial institutions and insurance institutions would not have conversations on security, right? We would not be collaborative at all. And I think that needs to change. And I think we are changing that. But one of the things that we have to do is be able to reach back. And I think small organizations, their challenge is budget, right? Their challenge is budget as well as resources. Um, and, you know, as you said, Sue, there, there's a really big challenge when there's larger organizations coming into um, localities, right, um, that are willing to pay, you know, sometimes 200% of what some of the smaller organizations can pay. And so we have to look at that and be willing to help and try to figure out what we do um, to, to fortify and work together more as a community. Yeah, thanks Octavia. And I know Sammy, the center does quite a bit of work around kind of educating and putting out information to help Canadian companies. How, how do you think 
uh, they're doing? What more could we do? Is it working? Um, what are your thoughts? I think we need to do a better job at communicating the available resources. There's a number of programs for small and medium businesses uh, that the Cyber Center either launched uh, the, cyber, the, the security baseline security control for small and medium businesses. Uh, some have certifications. There, I don't think that they are that well known and, and through forums like that, hopefully we bring lights to their availability and they can jump in. And, and uh, that many of them are accepted industry standard on cybersecurity. We're not asking or not suggesting, uh, you know, a very complex technical uh, development, but, but it's how do we have that conversation with the small and medium businesses um, uh, so that we can bring awareness to the issue. Quickly on ransomware, I would say also that many of the incidents are underreported or not reported at all. And also through this conversation, we hope that people will recognize that there is value in reporting ransomware incidents. There's no um, you know, shame in, in doing it and that we learn from those incidents so that we can collectively raise the bar across Canada. Yeah, and we uh, we talked a little bit, um, Greg. Your your losses are going up dramatically, and and I think uh, what you had shared is is you do try to filter and look at companies based on certain criteria of what they need to be doing. Otherwise, it's really becoming quite a high risk. Can you share like what is that framework uh, of things you're looking for that that Sammy had also referred to? Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, a lot of them are exactly where what, what Sammy just meant it, mentioned, excuse me, and, and pointing to the guidance that the center has put out, um, that the CIO Standards Council has, has um, you know, um, taken as well and, and put through. And, and it, it doesn't need to be massively expensive, but there's um, the underwriting side of, of cyber insurance over the last two years has moved more to um, just to give a, a little bit of an, of an example of what a scourge ransomware is. A lot of the uh, underwriting criteria are is, is aimed at helping mitigate and prevent severity impact as a result of, a, of an organization getting hit by ransomware. So that what does that mean? That means things like um, patching patching cadence. So making sure that your systems are patched, hardware is patched, you know, as a result of that, um, there's end of life hardware issues. So, you know, the, there's some items that, that stick out right away. But on top of that, things like um, integrity of your backups and keeping your backups uh, off like a copy of them offline. We're looking for modern backups. Um, you know, you look at tapes and discs and great, that's, that's an offline copy maybe, but your recovery time objective has to be uh, increased on the basis that, you know, it, it takes longer uh, to recover when, you, when you're only relying on tapes. And, and that technology was really meant to help uh, organizations get through floods and fires, not ransomware mm -hmm. specifically. Right. So um, on top of that, we're now looking at... Um, you know, next generation endpoint detection. Um, you know, I think that there's a, a bit of democratization that needs to happen in that world for small and micro businesses. You know, it's it's really um, in the licensing, that element can be a little bit more expensive. But on top of that, we wanna see plans in place. You know, we practice fire drills, we practice all of these things. Um, you know, it's, it's very likely that your business is going to be affected in some way, shape or form by a cyber related incident. So how's your preparedness? Do you know who's gonna help? Do you know who's gonna handle things internally? Do you know who's gonna communicate with external stakeholders? All of these things become Im important and practice makes perfect. But on top of that, the, uh, the one that seems to be uh, the, the toughest for businesses to realize that they need to adopt and from an insurance perspective, this is a byproduct of the work from home and the stress that that networks were put under was multi-factor authentication for remote network access. And so having that second set of validation to show that it is actually you that's trying to access the networks. And I've, I've used an analogy, uh, I think it was at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, when, when seat belt, when seat belts were, were mandated, it took a whole bunch of fussing and humming and hawing for this action to happen. 
And now it's as simple as reaching into one's pocket and going like this. Um, you know, it, I, I think we, we just, we need to be better at it. And uh, organizations, small, medium, and large, um, need to take the protective measures to, to keep threat actors off of their networks. And, you know, we can't leave our doors open. So I, I like the analogy, um, Greg, to seatbelts, which were probably, you could say, a standard, right? And, you know, we've talked about communication and collaboration. You know, I heard an analogy from an expert that I shared with the panel before around, you know, we don't have to worry about as individuals and companies and schools and hospitals um, that a missile will come and hit our house or our organization. We have NORAD protecting us. But when it comes to cyber, we all have to look after ourselves, the big companies, the small companies, the government, the healthcare centers. So is there room for standards? Um, and maybe I'll ask you, Carrie, um, you know, should we be creating something that says, you know, if you're a company above X size, here's what you need below this size, here's what you need. Do we put a seat belt around this to say, for the good of the economy, because this is having and certainly escalating in terms of impact um, on our companies and our organizations and our institutions and ultimately consumers whose data gets compromised uh, at the end of the day. Do we need standards? So the answer is yes, but I think as some of the other panelists have pointed out, those many of those standards exist. We have a awareness and adoption and enforcement problem. And I think where this is most pertinently hurting us in our collective system of defense, if you can call it that, is in our supply chain relationships. So we have many companies who have invested in implementing the security controls that Greg has talked about, you know, uh, it's kind of next generation protections and security awareness programs and incident response programs and, you know, uh, rehearsals and practice and all of those things. But all of that is for naught if the service provider who's either got your critical customer doesn't have any of those things. They can get ransomware just as easily, or in fact, more easily, and then you have the same problem. And so I think the challenge that we're seeing today is um, that relies on our collective system of contracting and paper to enforce, which is not a good mechanism to you know, develop this uh, strengthening of security and exchange of trust between the different companies in our in our supply chain ecosystem. And outside of Canada, you know, we're growing more and more reliant on a global supply chain. And, uh, you know, that, that further complicates the matter. So I think just to close off on that point and to maybe play the devil's advocate a little bit to some of the other panel members, there are some very systematic practices in Canada nationally, which we should reconsider. Um, for example, um, the insurance underwriters would not necessarily recognize you if you were compliant with some of the standards or programs that have been mentioned, even though they will give you credit if the security controls are implemented, right, that there's no incentive there. Some of the legal firms that uh, small businesses go to in the event of a ransomware breach will be told it's in their legal interest if they're facing a lawsuit not to disclose it to the cyber center, not to disclose it to law enforcement, right to like uh, uh, communicate as little as possible, to provide as little exposure as possible. That's not helping us with the, with the collective threat, right? And then finally, we have to remember that um, we're dealing with very serious and sophisticated foreign-based threat actors out there who are doing this to us. And while we can all invest in the perfect defenses, that still may not be enough. We also have to have a national strategy about what we can do to contain those threats. And like the, a police force in Canada is not going to be able to arrest someone who's operating out of Russia or North Korea or some of these safe havens where they operate. So we need some leadership in our national security community to figure out other tactics that they can employ to disrupt these threat actors on our behalf as part of the solution but not at the expense of us investing domestically in our defenses at the same time. So there's almost conflicting pressure around, you know, we're, we're only going to do this together. We're only going to protect ourselves together and through sharing, as you said, Octavia and transparency, yet there's pressure not to disclose and reveal <clears throat> what is potentially a weakness or a legal exposure. 
so maybe maybe Octavia, like how do we tackle that? And to the point around, um, you know, third party risk, you know, in the days when, you know, a company, everything was insulated and you built your own stuff, you know, probably, although old tech, you know, you had a perimeter. Now we have, you know, data lakes have become data rivers and we're dealing with third parties who, to Carrie's point, may be at risk, maybe not have the level of, of standards in their operation and we're bringing data in or leveraging their technology platforms. Octavia Equifax is a global company operating in 24 jurisdictions. How do we manage that? Yeah, I think we really have to be uh, be mindful and be really uh, purposeful in our third party risk um, program and what we do. Again, building those relationships. I, I kind of liken it to when I was initially starting off in cyber, like you had vendors, right? And those vendors, you were very transactional with those vendors, right? You purchased a product that vendor gave you that product and then you signed a, a, a legal document and they went away and you used said product, right? We have to get to the point where our vendors are our partners and, are, and really have a strategic relationship with them. Um, if they are going to, if we're sending our data through them, if, they're, if we're going to be trusted, right? We have to be able to hold our vendors accountable as well, right? It's important that we understand exactly what our third parties are doing, what protections they have, and hold and test those protections as well, right? I, I liken it to we had a conversation with a vendor, and during the conversation, they asked why we needed certain protections enabled, right? Why do you need this thing? And my response to them is we owe it to our consumers and our customers, and this is something that is a requirement for us to be able to have this thing. And if you cannot adhere to our requirements, then we're going to have to find another vendor because instead of acting like a, a partner, you are now a vendor, which a vendor is actually disposable. So I think we have to be very, very cautious of our third parties and work as a partnership, not, not threatening or anything like that, but really hold them accountable to the standards, right? And make sure that they, that they know that we're protecting them and, and they're protecting us as well. So Sammy, I want I want to hear your response. Um, thanks, Octavia. Around you know what Carrie's suggesting, we do need a national strategy. It is you know sort of imperative for the ecosystem. How um, how worried is the government, the federal government, in terms of what's happening and whether we're winning or losing? Um, what do you think about a national strategy? What do you think about a national standard? Um, what kind of what what would the what would you know prime minister trudeau say if he was in this on this panel um i think well uh there is a cyber uh, there's a national cyber security strategy that was written in 2018 or so um it has it's currently undergoing a mid midpoint review but in the process of that midpoint review we are in the process of starting a new national cyber security strategy and we will invite the, the private sector to participate in providing some input. It's important that, you know, what we thought of in 2018 and what the reality of 2022 are two different worlds. It's more than just five years uh, or four years apart. A lot has changed. So we need to make sure that the new cybersecurity strategy is one that reflects the current environment, but one that, you know, has some a foresight in it that that we can see into the future and we don't have to constantly be writing new strategies almost every year so we will be inviting uh, this year the the private sector to provide input on how do we uh, how do we tackle some of the points that Kerry had uh, had raised uh, it is absolutely true that that uh, people are afraid to report uh, incidents and uh, you mentioned earlier you, the analogy of NORAD and I say Every business out there is, is part of that early warning system. And, and if, if the system, the system can only be as effective if the signals are heard. And, and if I don't hear the signal that some incident happened in a little town somewhere or in a big city, there's not much we could do uh, about it. So, so it's a team effort. And as Carrie and Octavia mentioned, you know, we need to all pull together and, and share that information, but also tackle some of the legal challenges that, 
that are out there, some of the preoccupations. And I hope that through that consultation for the new cyber uh, strategy, we can, we can refine that so that we can get working on, on how do we tackle that. Okay, so I just want to ask you something. Um, sorry, this is you, you said we're updating the old one and we're doing a new one. That sounds no, like a little bit the, of government bureaucracy. Sorry. In the process of doing the media review right. of the old one, it, decided. It, we decided to start writing a new one. Uh, so, so because the, again, it's a strategy that was written in 2017, 2018. And the media review pointed out that there is a lot more work to be that is not reflected in that old strategy. So we need to put pen to paper and start capturing the reality of 2022. So that's what we're doing right now. Got it. Sounds awesome. Look forward to the consultation. And Greg, um, when we were talking before this panel, you said something which I thought was quite scary. I think it was almost two thirds of the companies um, that you had been insuring in the past. Today, you would consider uninsurable. So while we put together this national strategy or we think about standards, what, so are, what happens then? Those companies are just sort of freewheeling it, hoping, you know, ransomware doesn't happen, hoping they don't get targeted. What do they do? Um, yeah, I think not specific to our portfolio, but um, just in terms of the applicants that we see, I would say that about 60% are probably uninsurable in their current state. Hmm. Um, and a lot of that keep in mind that we focus on small mid-sized business, like typically under a half billion dollars in, in annual revenue. So we're looking at uh, businesses across all sectors that, um, you know, for, and, and this is where insurance hasn't done itself a very good solid, so to speak, right? Um, you know, we, we need to be more vocal in terms of what we're looking for. We need to communicate with our retail partners and, and that in itself will make its way down the chain to end user of the insurance or end procurer of the insurance. But right, right. insurance went from being the carrot to being the stick. And what I mean by that is, you know, cyber insurance, uh, buying a cyber insurance policy is not every organization's right. Um, you know, we, we, we do, you know, we're not a benevolent industry. Um, that's the reality. And when the house loses as much money as the house is losing, then there's gotta be a course correction. And we're seeing that right now. We're seeing that. And when it comes to the underwriting of this, you know, there's some levers that can be pulled. There's the most obvious one that a lot of people are probably finding out about as you go to renew your cyber insurance policy right now is price, you know? Um, so budget wise, you know, maybe double it. It's, it's depending on what sector you're in, uh, be prepared to not be able to procure it. Um, if you don't have X, Y, and Z, uh, that was, that was mentioned before as, as safeguards in place, but it's, um, it, it, the, it, you know, it, it's, it's one of those items that, um, we're, it's a big challenge right now. Um, I feel for our, our brokers and we're trying to communicate as quickly as we can based on the known mitigators of potential loss at the end of the day. So, you know, if, if we're looking forward, um, you know, what are you going to need to do tomorrow in order to be, be able to keep it not, sorry, because you're never going to be able to keep a hundred percent of, of the threats out of your networks. It's just how resilient can you be? when something does go on. So how do you prevent lateral movement within networks? I'm getting a little technical right now, so I'll, I'll back off and, and probably uh, let Sammy, Octavia, and Carrie uh, speak, to, speak to some of this, but the, the insurance community uh, is not going to continue to, uh, to take losses the way that it has been for, for the last number of years. And so that, uh, the challenge that we have right now is, simple economics it's it's supply and demand and the cyber insurance policies you know we know they're not inelastic um however the the industry itself seems to be testing the elasticity of the product itself um 
and I think there's there's more change that's that's going to make its way into Canada because as Canada has been losing money internationally uh, in the cyber world uh, for quite some time. So the opportunity there were a lot of very smart uh, CFOs out there, and when you look at the payback periods on these insurance policies, why would I spend money on controls? Why would I look at CapEx or OpEx as it relates to security when there's a naive insurance company that's going to take uh, for pennies on the dollar all of the risk off of our own balance sheets? Those days are gone. And so now it's a course correction and companies of all sizes are being forced to catch up as it relates to security uh, adequacy and control. So if, if you had invested in your cyber program previously, um, you know, you're probably in a better spot than a lot of small micro businesses in Canada who just don't know where to turn. So speaking of investing in our cyber profile, Octavia, that's a good segue to what um, Equifax learned post a cyber attack in 2017, which I would say gave the, uh, the company the opportunity to really get out ahead of that. That was a very expensive um, situation, not just in terms of uh, fines and, and resulting, you know, actions against the company, but also obviously brand and reputational damage. So kind of in the spirit of sharing and transparency, maybe Octavia walk us through kind of what happened and lessons learned and what have we done practically as a company, uh, if you could share that. Yeah, um, so as, as Greg was speaking, I was, you know, thinking large businesses are not immune to, uh, to cyber attacks, nor are they immune to not being properly prepared, right? Matter of fact, the, the larger organization and the older the organization, typically those are the ones that struggle with resetting and, and really trying to come up with a cyber plan until something large happens, right? So as is very widely known, Equifax did have a cyber attack in 2017 and that, that taught us a lot of lessons. One, about transparency and openness, right? Um, and that's why we've changed and course corrected. And we're very transparent and open and willing to share now. Because previously, that was something that was a sticking point for a lot of our industry. On top of that, we, you know, because of the nature of the attack, we had a full evaluation of our process and our, our posture. Um, once that evaluation was done, we invested $1.5 billion in upgrading our infrastructure, looking at our cyber uh, plans and our resiliencies, as well as those things. We set up a, a fusion center. Instead of outsourcing our SOC, we were able to see all of the data that's actually being um, sent through our network. We have a full threat intelligence organization that uh, speaks multiple languages, right? And we're able to actually go on the dark web and see any threats to our consumers or our customers. We've done the work, right? And we continue to do the work and we continue to look at our infrastructure and our community as partners. And I think that's one of the things that we have to continue to do, right? Once we got to a point where now Equifax is considered a leader in the industry, we didn't stop there. We won't stop until we, you know, look and make sure that we have not eliminated any type of um, cyber incident that may come, but we are really trying to mitigate the risk of it happening again, and then also mitigate the risk of it happening to our partners and to our customers as well. That's great. Thank you. And I'm, I'm, very pleased to hear that. Certainly here in Canada, we have about 28 million consumers records um, around driver's license, SIN numbers, mortgage information, et cetera. So it's very sensitive data um, that we take very seriously. But I feel like when I hear all of you talk about how sophisticated these threat actors are, the nation states are, you know, some of the corporations, and I would put us in the, into that category at Equifax, um, like how do we, and, but yet I still hear that CISOs around town at the banks at, you know, Sammy, you have lots of conversations. 
it's still in the old physical world, like I'm going to pick up the phone and tell you about what I'm seeing out there. Like it feels like we're not using technology to fight what is a very technical, advanced engineering kind of problem. How do we how do we bring more of the the tech in to fight this problem? And that's kind of open to anyone who wants to jump in because it just sort of struck me as I was listening here. Kick it off and then look to others who maybe contribute. So I think there's an element of tech that's already in those conversation and that element of tech is a uh, number of threat feeds. So the cyber center puts out a threat feed and, and people can subscribe to that threat feed and get the latest IOCs. Uh, but the flip side of that, I think, is what's missing is when there is an incident, how does that information flow then back upstream to the cyber center, to the insurance companies and so on in a timely way? So we keep seeing at the speed of cyber. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes uh, seconds matter or, or hours matter and saying, I'll let you know in two weeks uh, might be might be a moot point. So. Uh, but but that's built on trust, and that trust, uh, you know, is through forums like that that we end up developing it by getting to know each other and and sort of working together and partnerships. And as I say in the cyber center, you know, our mantra is security through collaboration. So let's let's find opportunities to collaborate so that we can build a trust, so that when there is an incident, that incident is shared as timely as possible, so that we can help the rest of the country. But I think right now it might be a little bit more one way ish and we need to uh, do it uh, kind of bi directional. But I welcome others' uh, input on that. Maybe Sue, if I can comment next on that. Um, I think what you're talking about is situational awareness, right? It's a security professional's ability to understand what's going on from a threat perspective in their environment. But there's more to security than just operations in the situation. There's also the engineering that's you know built in by design into these processes and critical infrastructures, which is a big component. And then um, for whatever reason, we're infatuated with the idea of eliminating people from every form of like process that goes on. But the only the, the big difference maker in almost every security situation is human judgment. Right. I mean, that's what we do as professionals. And so um, while I would love the technology to do everything but the human judgment, that's kind of the challenge for the industry is to, like, you know, get us out of the r routine and mundane tasks. And and our tooling is just not there yet because vendors are too afraid to prioritize, because if they don't tell you about something and you get breached, then you're going to say it's your fault. Right. So um, so instead, we overwhelm our security professionals with what is just a bunch of noise. Uh, for not having the right accountability structures. And um, if we could solve anything, you know, that was, I, that's one of the most productive things to me that we could fix is real, truly understanding where the accountability lies in the people process technology chains. And if we were correctly focused on that, I think we would be much more efficient as a community. Yeah, and I would say, you know, I heard someone say one time that security is like a dance. Right, you have your engineers, you have your threat intelligence team that's doing their job. The CISOs aren't going to be the ones looking at like data going across the the wire, right? That is for the threat hunters, that is for the SOC, that's for those who um, are really into that. But what we can do is when there's a threat, when there's something going on, we can talk and we can collaborate with one another and then feed that back, right? We we dance, we feed that back to our engineers. We actually have those meetings and figure out what we're doing and how we can actually be proactive. And I, I think Carrie hit it dead on the head, right? We, we have to remember that that human element and that judgment is what actually makes us protective and actually brings us closer to being able to solve these problems. If we rely on machines, then that's where we kind of go and, and the machines can fail us each time. All right. Awesome. Well, listen, um, so a little bit of optimism, um, you know, I think we're, we're learning quickly, uh, if we can say there's a silver lining. I really want to thank all of you, uh, Greg, Carrie, Sammy, Octavia, great discussion, so much uh, more. So we'll have to get together again, but really appreciate you joining me uh, here today at the Payments Canada Summit. Thank you so much.